I've lost where everybody is. Brittany, Brittany, you want to go ahead? Oh, you're recording. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to get to know you and you to get to know us. And we're going to talk about the PhD in human resource development. So I'll go ahead and um, kind of go through this deck, but know that if you've got questions along the way, feel free to send them in the chat. Um, I may not be responding in the chat while I'm talking. I don't think I'm that good at multiplexing, but we've got other folks on here. Um, we've got faculty and some students and we'll have an alum come in later and um, we will get make, make sure we answer your questions. So I do wanna kind of start out with some introductions and I'm gonna go in no really particular order other than the way they show up in my Zoom um, menu. And so I want to introduce you to people that if you do choose to apply to this great program that you will be talking to via email. So I think it's so wonderful to put a, a face to an email. And so I'm going to introduce Alicia Wolf and, and Alicia, if you'll just say what your title is, because I don't, I don't think I'll like, speak to that. <laughs> they change often. Yeah. I'm the assistant dean of the graduate school. Okay. And then Brittany Riley. And mute myself quickly. Hi, everyone. I am the Executive Director of Graduate Admissions. And Greg Wong. Hi, I'm a Professor of HRD in the Department of HRD. And Cynthia Martinez. Hi, um, Cynthia. I'm Executive Director for the Office of International Programs. And Elizabeth Lee. Oops, you're muted. Liz, can you unmute? There you go. Oh, there we go. I'm the graduate academic advisor. Okay. And Lauren Henley? I am also a graduate academic advisor. And Yan Chu Cho? Hi. Uh, uh, my name is Yan Chu Cho, joining uh, UT Tyler. This is my second year as an associate professor. Very good. And Paul Roberts? Hi, I'm Paul Roberts. I'm a professor of HRD. And Judy Soon? Hi. I'm Judy Sun, Associate Professor of HRD. And Ralph Ryan. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Ralph Ryan. I'm a second year PhD student. Okay, and we'll probably have another, um, some other faculty, oh, have, I'm sorry, one other student coming and then an alum that's coming after she gets done with class. And Ralph Ryan, if you've got a minute, maybe text Amy Baskin because she's supposed to be on and maybe she's just delayed, just make sure that she knows that she's welcome to come whenever she can. So we've got the introductions done. And then I think we'll hopefully have time for all of our guests to come introduce themselves. But we'll go maybe do that towards the end because people may still be trickling in. Um, so what I wanna do is talk about the opportunity that there is with this great PhD program and then I'm gonna turn this over to uh, the graduate school and um, also the international office. And they're gonna talk about delivery method, application procedures, cost, um, what it means if you're an international student. And then hopefully we'll have given tons and tons of time about questions, but we also have email addresses in this deck. So if somehow we don't get your question, feel free to reach out to any of us um, as you think about this program. So the opportunity really here is what we're doing is we're offering opportunity to develop knowledge, skills, and relationships for folks that want to be a scholar or a scholar practitioner in the field of HRD. And HRD is different than HRM. And in fact, and, and Dr. Wong, we're so blessed. We're blessed with all of our faculty, but in, in particular with Dr. Wong as it relates to this subject, because that has been his a big part of the study of his research is defining what HRD is. And so he's developed what's called the HRD wheel. And so I'm gonna go ahead and present that to you and let Dr. Wong speak to that because I think it's helpful for you to understand what we are because what we are is also what we're not, right? So I'll let him speak to this wheel. Okay, um, this is the uh, research I've been doing for about uh, 10 years, and uh, this is a semi product, and uh, we have not published yet, but for the purpose of clarifying what HRD is and is not, it's a good starting point. So I've been using this in my classes as well. Uh, as you can see on the this this is a big wheel on the left hand side is uh, what we know about uh, 
general term of HR. Uh, basically, it is a human resource management. Uh, and on the right hand side, it is HRD. And some other places, organizations also call it talent, man, uh, talent development, TD. For instance, Association of Talent Management is the practitioner organization is on this side. So as we know that uh, this is actually based on my uh, definition, the new definition of HRD. It states very simple, HRD is all about uh, shaping and scaling in a given institutional host organization, which is the host of HRD or HRM. And the shaping is all about uh, uh, values, beliefs, development to change people's uh, mindset. Uh, on the wheel here, there was a little uh, typo, but I want to factor uh, understanding here. So, uh, and then uh, what we say about change in HRD is all about shaping part. And then learning is about including unlearning. And sometimes we call it uh, dislearning. And of course, learning is a big part. And then HRD is all about performance. Of course, this performance about is a performance improvement in the US Western context. This organizations always want to make things uh, faster, better, cheaper, which is speed, quality, and cost. And uh, also uh, different from the HRM part, uh, HRD has a macro level. So with this definition, we clarify, classify HRD has a micro HRD is at individual level and organizational level. At macro level, it is at the regional, national, and even international level, talking about uh, workforce development uh, policies, national HRD policies is on this side. But on the other hand, uh, HRM is more of a micro uh, area, practice and research. It's all about organizations, individuals, firing, hiring, uh, operations, and maintenance. So this this whole chart, sometimes it may not, in some organizations, they may not have a HRD labeled department, but the function is there. So we're generally speaking from the functional area. And also the key thing for research is all about uh, explaining what it is and why it is it's, and predict what's going to be in the future. It is not about how to do it. For instance, how to make a change, how to change people's values, beliefs. It's all uh, up to the practitioner in their practice. So to make a long story short, I could talk about this for, mm -hmm. for days, but uh, to make a long story short, that's the brief version of uh, what we're doing here about HRD. Thanks, thanks, Greg. And just so for folks that are gonna are listening today and that might be listening to this later, recognize that we do have students that have come into the program with an HRM, ex, um, HRM experience and training and they've done very well. But I just wanna make sure that which, what we're focusing on our curriculum is the HRD side. Okay, so one of the things that's somewhat unique about our program when you look at other HRD programs is that we are in a college of business. And that has been a really phenomenal opportunity um, for all of us to grow. And we think it whole, makes a lot of sense of where HRD, HRD is, is sitting along um, in, this, in this suite with other um, uh, op positions like COOs or learning officers, uh, chief learning officers. And so we think it makes a lot of sense that, that, that we are within the college of business. And when you see um, where a lot of our alumni are placed, you'll certainly see that. I do want to make you aware of um, something called um, the Academy of Human Resource Development. And this is a link that's helpful. This is our professional home. 
And we call it AHRD. So if you ever hear us talking in, in um, abbreviations like we all do, then you'll know that. And so part of what um, the Academy does is has a program excellence network. And so pro program institutions where are, that are providing undergraduate and graduate education in the area of human resource development are part of this program excellence network. And if you were to review all these different um, institutions that are in that box that are, um, it's just too much to fit on my one screen, but if you were to review all those, you would see that we are that only institution that is in the College of Business. Um, in other parts of the world, um, we say sometimes across the pond, it's, it is more common for HRD programs to be in a College of Business. It's just, it's, we are somewhat um, leading edge in that perspective. So I wanna bring that to your attention. Um, you've got an opportunity here, and I think um, sometimes, and, and we'll let our students and, and alum kind of speak to this later, um, even though UT Tyler might be considered um, a, a regional school, um, it, it, it is composed of people in this field, in the human resource development field, that are leading scholars. And so just, you kind of met them, but I want to bring up this site with the internet will cooperate with me. There we go. And so I'm not talking about myself, but I'm gonna talk about these other people. So the Academy of Human Resource Development, for example, has four different journals. It has a journal which is Human Resource Development Quarterly. It has advances in um, developing human resources. It has Human Resource Development International, and it has Human Resource Development Review. Our team of faculty have served as editors, associate editors, or co-editors of three of those four journals. And I don't think there's another institution that can speak to that. The only one that we have not had a leadership role in the, in the editorial perspective is Human Resource Development International. And I somehow suspect that when we start to review, we look for candidates, we may look for somebody that has that expertise so Yan Chu Cho, for example, is the current editor-in-chief for Human Resource Development Review. That is an amazing journal. Her journal and Human Resource Development Quarterly are two um, of the four journals. They are two of the ones that are SSCI indexed. And that means that they have been recognized by um, a clearinghouse and have very, very high impact factors, meaning that not only is the work getting published, but it's getting cited and it's getting used a lot. And that's what that means if you're not familiar with that academic perspective. Michelle McCorder, who you, I, I don't know if you met her or not, I can't remember if she was on, I don't think she's, she's on. But anyway, she is amazing. She is serving as the Associate Editor for Advances in Developing Human Resources, which is more, I think, more of a practitioner related journal. And so that's probably why it hasn't had an SSCI impact because it just doesn't really fit what they publish. Uh, Paul Roberts um, has been here. We sometimes say he knows where the where the bodies are buried. I don't think he buried any of them, but he still knows where they are. Um, he comes from a long, long background and um, with career technical education and a lot of understanding of what institutions are doing as it relates to human resource development. Judy Soon um, is an amazing scholar and she is sitting on the board of um, the Academy of Human Resource Development. And Greg Wong, you've already heard him. You, you have a sense of his research. Um, uh, Greg served as a, I think, the quantitative methods editor for human resource development quarterly. When then he left to take on another position of a Chinese journal as it related to human resource development, which then gave me the opportunity to take his old job. And then I moved up through the ranks and um, completed my role as co-editor of human resource development quarterly. So we are really involved in the academy. And that was like one of the reasons that I came here um, from, a, from a different institution was because we are all so really linked into this academy and doing a lot and putting a lot of our discretionary effort into this field. So that's an opportunity. And then you can read all um, more about us and kind of what our research agendas are and see all of our vetas are current. So you could kind of look at that. And so the opportunity really is to connect and have meaningful connections with any one of us or many of us, if you like, as you go through the program. Another opportunity is to network with our alumni. And it's really been fun. We had a writing retreat this summer and it was our very first one to do. 
And um, I was a little nervous about publishing it as an annual one because I thought, well, I'm not sure I'll ever want to do this again. But anyway, it turned out really good. <laughs> so I wish I had, wish I had, I have these little tumblers and they say 2021 uh, writing retreat because I thought that might be the only time we ever do it. <laughs> but probably could have bought more of them if I'd said annual writing retreat. But it was great fun because what we did is we, we had students that were in classes and they came, stayed, they came a little early, stayed a little late and participated in the writing retreat. We had folks that are working on their dissertations, and then we also had alumni come in. And so what a fun way to connect and, and for learning to occur and for people just to have conversations about, oh, yeah, I remember taking that class of nine and that was horrible. And then, yeah, but this is how you get through it. And, and oh, oh, you'll get through the dissertation. All those fun things are going on. And so it's a really, um, a really kind of tight community that you're coming into. And so it's kind of like a family. Now you can, you know, you don't have to be part of the family. You don't have to come to the family reunion. You can kind of, you know, be outside of that. But if you want to, it really is, it's a great opportunity. And so I wanted to show you, this is, um, I think this list changes on a pretty constant basis. But here are where a lot of our UT Tyler PhD graduates have been placed in higher education. And what's really neat to me is so a lot of our, a lot of our alums, that are in academia or not academia, they come to this AHRD conference. It's usually held in February. It's um, also usually held in a horrible place that would be in February, someplace where it's snowy, as opposed to someplace that would be warm and wonderful. But nonetheless, that makes, there's no, nowhere to go because it's cold outside. So we all stay inside in the hotel. And then it's great because we have these opportunities to network and talk. And I can remember when COVID hit, we were all texting each other um, and saying, okay, how are you, how are you adapting your classes and, and handling this kind of thing? And so that opportunity to network with folks, not just while you're in the program, but while you're outside the program really, really is incredible. And what you can see here is people are everywhere. I mean, there are a lot of people that are in Texas, but there are people in Georgia and in California, and you're gonna meet um, Kristen Scott, who's in Louisiana. And what is really fun is that now we are seeing our alum hire our students. And that's, that's an amazing thing for a program that really is not very old. And to, to see that already happening, I think is really exciting. I could do like Greg and talk about all of our alum all day long, but you know, uh, Lisa would probably be kind of pulling, pulling off the Zoom or, or disconnecting me. But I do wanna kind of show you to one person, um, Julia Fulmore. And I'm going to bring her screen over here. She is at the University of Dallas, and she um, has this opportunity. She's serving as an assistant professor of management, and she's teaching in their DBA program that is accredited by AACSB. And what they hired her to do was to basically take those DBA students and teach them the quantitative methods core of their program. They hired her before she had even proposed her dissertation. They were that impressed with her work. And so she has done an excellent job um, and their program is, is just doing incredibly well. And she's been able to use the information that she learned here and to convey that information to her students. And so all, all of our alums have other stories like that, but I just kind of wanted to point that out. Um, if you want to talk to any of our alums, um, I'm gonna show you um, another, another link that lists all of our alums and their email addresses. Um, and you are welcome to con contact them. I think they would love to talk to you and tell you about the program. All right, then not everybody goes into academia. I mean, that was what I, I did when I, I had had a long career um, running a um, engineering company with a hundred engineers and I wanted to make an academic tr transition in work. And so that's what I did. I left that line of work to do this. But other folks are um, using the PhD pr program as a way to um, stay into practice. And so I just wanted to bring over uh, Paula Anthony is an example of that. And so Paula Anthony um, has worked at UT Health East Texas. Um, she's also doing um, some consulting, I think, as, as things have transitioned. She serves at UT Tyler as an adjunct professor. And so a lot of folks do that. 
they have whatever it is their, their day job is and they continue on, but they do that in a different way. A, a lot of our folks go, do consulting, either they have done consulting internally or externally, and sometimes folks build new consulting businesses with the expertise that they've learned in getting that PhD program. And for a consultant, having those extra little letters by your name is certainly a, a great opportunity there. And then I wanna kind of just show you um, uh, the curriculum so you get a sense of what that looks like. And you can go, go through and look all this, but what the important aspect is, is there is an ODC, ODC a specialization, so organ, organizational development and change. So there's a specialization in that. And I think it's a really nice core where you, you learn about organizational change and development. And you probably already know about that, but you learn about it um, more from an academic perspective as well as practice. So kind of merging those two things together. You spend a semester kind of learning about organizational interventions that have been proven to be successful in companies. And then you take all that information, come together, and you do an organizational consulting project. You go out and get a gig and apply that information. And so I think that's a very practical expertise um, that will help you in whatever it is you're doing next. There's also then a, a core set of courses that relate to the theory of HRD and the literature of HRD and leadership and talent management. And then what you see in the, in the kind of middle part of this is 27 hours of research courses. I think we are unique in that we have not just an excellent quantitative core, we also have a very good qualitative core. So you're gonna come out of here really well prepared to do any type of, any type of research you wanna do. Now I always tell people, you may not have everything you need to know to do your particular dissertation, but you're gonna have that foundation. So from that foundation, you can go off and learn some other technique. Cause I mean, you know, we'd love to keep you here forever, but the graduate school would probably complain that it kept people here too long. But you know, what we're doing is giving you a base for continuous learning. And so um, when our students go to the Academy of Human Resource Development and present, um, that's, that's when they really see the differentiation between what other programs have and what we have, because we are presenting, our students are presenting using data analytic techniques that maybe some other professors haven't had that exposure to. And so it really is a very, very rigorous program from, from that perspective. Okay, I think I've probably talked enough and, oh, maybe, I don't know who's gonna talk about this. You, you guys want me to talk to this slide? Graduate school? Sure. Okay. Okay. So the way we do this, um, folks, you can get through all your coursework in two years. Now, I'm not saying you're going to sleep. You're not going to do a lot of Netflix. You should still continue working out. Um, but um, it's it's intense. Three classes, three, three credit hours each. That's nine hours. Nine hours in the fall, nine hours in the spring, and six hours in the summer. And then you do that one more year. So it's really intense, two years, but then you've got all your, all your coursework done. And then from then you work on your dissertation format. We offer those courses in an executive format program, meaning that you come in for five class meetings in the fall and five class meetings in the spring and four in the summer. So generally the way that works in the fall, it's like we're in the fall right now, the fall Friday class is from three in the afternoon until seven in the evening. And that gives the cohorts time to go out and, you know, have dinner together, kind of socialize, get to know each other. Then they come back Saturday and take a class Saturday morning and one Saturday afternoon. And then they do that every three weeks. And then in between time, then we use Canvas as our learning management system. And there's opportunities to continue to do work, assignments, things like that, preparing for the next class meeting. And so again, two years, all your coursework done, and then you, you go off to do your dissertation after you take a prelim exam. Okay, now I'm not gonna talk about cost. <laughs> I can jump in here and talk about cost a little bit. Um, so UT Tyler is part of the University of Texas system. So it's a prestigious school, but we do have a very affordable um, education here at the university. So. For the entire program, if you study along that schedule that Dr. Nyman just presented, the estimated cost is going to be about $30,000 
for a uh, Texas resident. Um, that is only for Texas residents. That's an estimate based on the current tuition and fee schedule. So it is subject to change, but that's about the best estimate that we can provide in advance of knowing the future. Um, and then for anyone who is not a Texas resident currently, we do have some opportunities that can help you get an in-state tuition waiver so that this cost is accurate for you as well. And um, one of those opportunities is the new graduate fellowship. And this is a scholarship. It's available to everyone who is admitted into the program to apply for. It's a $1,000 annual award. Um, and to be eligible, you would need to enroll full-time in the fall and the spring semester. So again, that schedule of classes that Dr. Nami presented and have at least a 3.25 GPA on either your undergraduate or your graduate degree, um, or a GRE score of 307, or a GMAT score of 500, depending on whichever exam you take. Um, you only need to meet one of those criteria to be eligible for the scholarship. And if you maintain a 3.25 GPA while you're studying with us, that scholarship is renewable. So anyone who applies and is awarded would get $1,000, and then a non-Texas resident or an out-of-state student would also get an in-state tuition waiver for that as well. So it's a great scholarship to help take care of some of that $30,000 price tag. Um, and then there are some potentially assistantship options available. I'm not sure if there is a slide on that or not. Um, but there are um, sometimes assistantship options available as well that would have a stipend um, potentially a waiver option uh, attached to that as well. Um, so yeah. well, we have had several we've had several students um, be very successful that, that were out of state. Um, one, one cohort had two folks from Florida. We've had people from, I'm going to say Indiana, but I get the I states all confused. Um, and we had somebody from Pennsylvania or Maryland. That's so kind of up there somewhere. Um, once one of my students was coming in from England for a while, that was kind of crazy. But anyway, so we it, it has been successful. And in fact, that's one of the reasons we went to, we used to, it used to be two years in a semester. And we changed it to go to two years so that we could get all that done, especially recognizing people flying in to, to make that as efficient as possible. Because we know that there's added expenses if you're flying in. Okay, admissions. Yes. Um, so for any of you who may be interested in this program, it does admit in the fall only each academic year. And to get started, um, you would need to submit a graduate school application, which is online. Um, it takes about five minutes to fill it out. It's not a huge deal. Um, and then after you apply, after you submit that application, we're going to email you a list of documents that we need for review. Um, so that will include both your bachelor's and your master's degree transcripts. If you have any other certifications or any additional degrees that you want us to review, any additional transcripts that you want to be reviewed, send those as well. But at minimum, we need the bachelor's degree and the master's degree transcript. Um, and those need to demonstrate a minimum GPA of 3.0. Um, now, I think, Dr. Nyman, you could probably correct me on this, if there is an undergraduate GPA below a 3.0, that's not something that should stop someone from applying, right? No, I, I didn't have one. Okay. <laughs> not, that I, not that I got my degree here, but anyway, but I understand that. So. Yeah. So if your undergraduate GPA is a little bit lower, still apply. There's still opportunity. Uh, and then usually for a master's degree, the 3.0 is uh, that's important. required to graduate. Yeah. So um, that graduate GPA is going to be something to look at. Um, GRE or GMAT scores taken within the last five years. And fortunately, there are no waivers available for that item. Um, that is I'm speaking on behalf of the committee here, but I think that they find that to be a really important indicator of success for students. And that time limit of five years is important as well. Um, a career statement, resume, three letters of recommendation, and a writing sample. I think, Dr. Nyman, the writing sample is that Required is that optional? It's not required, it's optional. It helps us get a sense um, of, of kind of where you are. Yeah. So these documents are all submitted to the Graduate Admissions Office. And once your packet, once your application is complete, that goes to the faculty who are on this call for them to review. And if they call you in for an interview, they take care of all of that with you and then they offer decisions. 
So the deadline by which to take care of all of these items is April 1st, 2022 for the upcoming fall 22 cohort. Um, so everything does need to be in by that time for the priority review. Um, and then hopefully we have the pleasure of extending an admissions offer, which is the best part about the whole process. Well, that is the best part. Well, I think the interview is a kind of a cool part too. And, and just, just, just to let you know about the interview is what we're looking for and what we're trying to see is we want to hear what you want to do with this PhD. And we want to make sure that, um, it, that it's a good fit. And sometimes it's not a good fit. I've talked to lots of different people and, and directed them to either a different doctorate program that we had here at UT Tyler, or sometimes at another institution that there's a better fit. And so we don't want you to be spending $30,000 and all the time away from your family and then end up getting a degree that won't get you where you want to be. And so, for example, if you want to be a professor in accounting, we are not the right degree for that because we're, we're not going to be prepared for that position. Um, Dr. Nyman, can you talk for just a minute uh, about the recommendation letters? For example, who should they be from and what are you guys looking for in the recommendation letters? Yeah, the recommendation letters I know, I know can be a little tricky because I can still remember writing, getting mine for when I was getting to the PhD program. I think I asked my priest, right? I'm thinking, why did, why did I ask him? I don't know. But he knew something about my character. He knew about my um, maybe my endurance and my tenacity of doing things. So those are things. If you happen to know somebody who has a PhD, that would be a great person because that person knows what it takes to get a PhD. And so they would hopefully be able to tap into some things about you that they would say, okay, this is, I, I think this person will be successful. That, that's all, that's all what all of this is, is trying to get some sense of whether we think you'll be successful or not. We get more applicants than we have seats for. And so it's, it's number one, seeing, you know, do we think you'll be successful? And sometimes it may, may mean that we think maybe if you would go, maybe go back to school or go do something else to prepare yourself um, to, to get into the program. I know I was totally stressed out when I went to do my PhD because I hadn't taken a math course in a long, long time. And so I ended up taking a master's level statistics course um, to help prepare me for the doctorate level statistics course, because there's nothing scarier in my mind than, a doc than the idea of a doctorate level statistics course. Once you get in, you find it's not that bad. But anyway, um, that's, so that's what we're looking for. Do, 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 do we think you're going to be successful? Do we think that whatever it is we have to offer is going to help you in your career goal? And all of these things, including those recommendations letters, are just trying to make that connection that you'll be that we think you'll be successful. Thanks for that. Also, um, can you give a couple of examples of what you're looking for in a writing sample? Oh, I'd love to see an article. So some a lot of our students come in with published articles. And so that's that, that you know, that I don't know, that gets stars, right? You, we notice that. We notice people that that have been published. That's good. And if you don't have that, probably in your master's degree somewhere, you would expect your professors would have asked you to write something. And so that's helpful. So a writing sample for your master's degree. We do use APA style. Don't stress out if you don't have something that's an APA style. But we are looking that you can kind of put a sentence together and a paragraph and a, and a cohesive theme and things like that. Because again, if you're not able to do that, you're going to be very unhappy in our in our program because we are expecting that you can you can write in an academic format. I see Amy Baskin's laughing, so she's she's smiling about that. Thank you. Okay, we want uh, Cynthia to talk about uh, international students. Hi, everybody. Um, once again, I'm Cynthia from uh, the Office of International Programs. And so the role that our office plays in this process is the I-20 requirement for um, incoming international students, whether you are a transfer student or a brand new student entering the US you will need an I-20 document. So we provide that I-20 document to students only after they have been fully admitted into the, um, their academic program of study. So to receive an I-20 document, it's actually really easy. Um, you have to submit a document called Certification of Responsibility. You have to submit a bank statement that um, demonstrates that you have sufficient funds to be able 
to be able to cover your educational and living expenses. Um, you do need to attach a sponsor letter. So for example, if the bank statement is not under your name, but let's say for example, the bank statement is under your uh, another family member's name, then we do need a sponsor letter from that individual. And then of course, we need to have a valid passport. Once we receive all of those documentations, then we will go ahead and issue um, what is referred to as the I-20. The I-20 then is required so you are able to obtain a, an appointment at a U.S. embassy um, in your home country. Um, once you obtain the I-20, make the appointment, then you go for a visa appointment. Once the visa is approved, then you can enter the country, um, but you can only enter the country 30 days before your program start date. Um, I do want to be specific about this program um, in regarding the visa. Because this program has only a certain number of seats that are available to students, the students that are international seeking admission into this program have to have their visas by June 30th. If visas are not obtained by June 30th, then um, the offer will be withdrawn or you will not be able to participate in the program, you would have to apply again um, for the next year because there is no admission in the spring semester. So you would have to reapply all over again um, for the next available um, academic school year. Um, are there any questions regarding the I-20 or visa process or anything like that? And I've got, I'm sorry, I've got Cynthia's email address too. So if you end up having questions afterwards or listen to this video later on, her email address is, is on there. Yes, I can, I can share the office email in the chat for everyone just in case there are other uh, questions, specific questions. So what I would encourage um, students for this program is to get admitted as, as soon as it is possible. Um, because you want to get that visa appointment. Um, I know that because of COVID, there are many um, consulates or embassies that are closed. So you want to make sure that you have the proper documentation so you can make that appointment on time. But I'll go awesome. ahead and share our office email. So if in case there are other questions, like I said, you can just go ahead and reach out. Yeah, so that April, April 1 priority deadline would be the deadline that you'd want to work towards. Okay. Um, so here are our deadlines. Um, Brittany, you want to take this? <laughs> yeah, happy to. Um, so like we mentioned, it is fall admission only, and the priority deadline is April 1. Now, for most students, if you can't meet the priority deadline, um, you, you may still apply. If there is space in the program, you may still be reviewed. It's hard to make guarantees after April 1st. So anyone who has the opportunity to finish their application by that priority deadline is definitely encouraged to do so. If you are finishing up your master's degree and that is the only thing you cannot get to us is your final graduate degree transcript, don't worry about that. We can work with that one particular item because obviously if you haven't graduated yet, it's gonna be hard to supply. But everything else, get it to us by April 1st if you can. Um, and then the faculty will review and um, official offers of acceptance will be issued soon after that deadline. Um, and then if, um, when you're submitting documents, those can be emailed to us at OGS at uttyler.edu. And then official transcripts need to be sent through official means, but most everything else can just be emailed to us. Um, and the scholarship deadline, so you need to be admitted in order to apply for the scholarship. And the deadline to do that is May 1st. So you should have your offer of admission in hand, ready to apply for the scholarship if you meet that April 1 deadline. Okay, so I here are the email addresses for questions, and, and I also wanted to kind of throw out some questions to some of our folks that are on here. And so Ralph Ryan, who you met before, is one of our current doctoral students, and he is in his second year. And so Ralph Ryan, I just wondered if you would kind of curious what, um, What's transformed? I mean, have you changed in your knowledge or what's happened? You've been here at UT Tyler for a year. What, what's gone? What's what's happened since then? Absolutely, Dr. Nyman. This past year has been 
fulfilling, exciting, and at times even challenging, but that's been one of the, it has been one of the greatest experiences so far of my life, just being on this PhD, PhD journey. And as I think about where I'm at today versus where I started, you know, a year ago, I have grown so much. And uh, specifically, I, I've really grown in my ability to write academically. I remember some of the first um, the, the first post I made in, in my course, of course, especially uh, specifically with Dr. Cho, and my writing was more geared towards business, right? What I do in a corporate setting, and as as I've um, written so much this past year, you know, from an academic perspective, I have grown immensely in that, and so that's been a, a great opportunity to really just write. We just write a lot. Um, and so I've really grown from that perspective and it's been great. Uh, and then secondly, you know, just my researching capabilities, you know, in each and every single one of my courses, having to dive into the literature and the peer reviewed journal articles uh, for assignments, for literature reviews and, and, and topics in some of, our, uh, some of our seminar classes. It has really helped me to, to understand information, uh, comprehend information, all types of information. And so just thinking about where I've um, where I'm at versus how who I was when I started, I have grown in a, in a lot of ways. So it's been an exciting uh, experience, and I would encourage anybody who is thinking about applying to to do so. Um, I, I'm glad I did it. Thank you, thank you. And so Amy's and Amy Baskin is in a little bit different position. She is what we call a doctoral candidate, which means she finished all her coursework and she is working on her dissertation. So I wondered, Amy, now as you're kind of sitting in here writing on your proposal, what do you think about the coursework and how did that prepare you for working on your dissertation proposal? Well, uh, you know, I had not done any uh, statistics or uh, research. Uh, I had done qualitative evaluation, which is the research that happens in a corporate setting. Uh, but I had not done any research, uh, quantitative research. And, um, I, you know, really it went from zero to a hundred. I, I knew nothing. And now I'm doing some really complicated statistical <laughs> process. I'm not quite sure why, but no, <laughs> no. Uh, but I am using um, a statistical process in my quantitative dissertation that is exciting and you know it, it i've always felt in business i'm definitely a practitioner uh that if i had the data i can make people understand why training is valuable and why hrd is an important piece or why leadership uh 360 kinds of things are really important because business people listen to data so I really feel like that part of me has grown significantly, uh, you know, and that all of our courses were in both quantitative and qualitative me um, methods were perfect and great in, in, a la in getting us to where we needed to be, especially me who really was nowhere. Because, um, you know, a lot of people come in and they have some of that background, but I really went, as I said, from a blank slate. And, and feel like that I've now added that skill set to both in quantitative and qualitative that I've added that skill set to my practitioner briefcase, if you want to put it. Um, that's good. Thank you. I like that professional briefcase. That's cool. All right. Thanks, Amy. And then Kristen Scott, Dr. Scott is here. Dr. Scott from McNeese University. I told you she was going to come in a little bit later because she was finishing classes. And so Kristen, um, Kristen is, is special because she was part of the 2014 cohort. They were the first cohort that I taught when I came here to UT Tyler. And so Kristen, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, what difference this PhD program has made in your life. And you're muted. I was so engaged with what Amy was saying <laughs> that I was completely not even thinking about what to say next, which Dr. Nyman can tell you is, uh, different for me. <clears throat> so the PhD program completely and utterly changed my life. I thought I knew I what I was going into because both of my parents have doctoral degrees and taught in a college of business. And even with their guidance, I really didn't quite 
understand the changes that were going to happen in me. I never thought I was going to be able to get through the doctoral statistics until I met Dr. Nyman. I had applied for the program. I started the program, but I was worried I wasn't maybe going to make it. But Dr. Nyman's guidance and tutorials and constant patience with me really made an amazing difference. And Dr. Nyman, I, I don't know that I've told you this, but some of the things I didn't quite understand when I graduated, knowledge has occurred. It continues <laughs> to occur. Some of those things that we did, and Amy, I'm sure you've experienced or will experience this. Some of these things that you're doing, you're doing because you know that's what you're supposed to do, but the aha moment might not come until later. Um, when I started the PhD, my thought was that I would go into administration at a community college level. Um, I had a, a open job offer, uh, but what happened when I finished was I got a job as an assistant professor at a small regional university, and I love it. Um, in the process of doing that, I doubled my salary. So the investment that I made, and it really was about $30,000. The investment I made in the PhD has been paid back in the first year. I mean, in the first year, the investment was paid back. Now, I'm still paying my student loans because I didn't throw all of that. But um, every year that I work, my increased income is just getting bigger. Uh, I have the opportunity to make money consulting. I have the opportunity to... Uh, apply for grants and professorships. I have the opportunity to not only put together my salary, but to do other things that can increase my earning potential even more. Um, I would say that of all the things that I have invested in my life, that the PhD has been uh, something that's given me the greatest financial return and the greatest personal return. Thanks, Kristen. I really appreciate that. Um, all right. I guess I sh I'll stop sharing. I should have done that before. I didn't want to do that in the middle of all this. And then we'll just open this up and anybody can open up. You know, I call it stump the professor, which is not hard for me. Um, just open up to ask anybody anything you'd like. Ignacio, go go ahead. Yes, thank you. Just a quick question. If I they send you two questions, if I send you the application, like for example in November, are you going to be able to give me a response before May or June, or or not? Sure. No, that's a really good question. Um, that our part, our deadline. Make sure I'm going to go back and make sure I don't say the date wrong. So our deadline is April one, and we start reviewing applications on April one. Okay. So we make and we make decisions in April so that folks can be eligible for that new graduate fellowship deadline, or not deadline for the new graduate fellowship award. But we don't we don't make any decisions before April. And another question is, mm -hmm. um, if I send my application in November, where, when should I expect the interview? The interview will be in April. Also, okay, mm -hmm. I get it. That's the first thing we do. We, we go through all those applications and then we schedule interviews very quickly right, right after that April 1 deadline. Perfect, thank you. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry, there's, I can't, the hands, something, but the hands just blur in the background. So yeah, because collaborative communities, I'm sure that you yeah. have a name. <laughs> Hello, I'm Bobby Anderson. I am um, actually graduate with my master's degree in December. So I'm very excited to look at the next step. Yeah. What I'd like to know, is it acceptable to have a reference from a UT Tyler professor? Oh, I think that's great, yeah. Let me, that's just, that's very good, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I remember your name, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> nice to yes. put name and face. 
together. I've had you a few times, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Rochelle, do you want to say hi? Because I know you popped in a little bit later. Sure. Hi, I'm Rochelle McWhorter. I'm associate professor here in the Department of HRD. And so I was like getting on. Welcome. I think it's always nice to put faces with emails because um, emails, especially my emails, bless your heart if you get one from me, they tend to become somewhat concise. Um, <laughs> so that's good and bad, but anyway. I think, but you've got, we've got a really great group here. Um, and then Elizabeth and Lauren, I don't know if you want to say anything else, but they're there. They're, they're, and this is always confusing even to me who's in here. We've got Brittany and Alisa who are from the graduate school. And then we have Elizabeth and Lauren who from the Souls Graduate Advising. And so, and don't, and I don't, can't say don't be confused because you will be confused in this process, who goes to what? But if you send it to somebody and it's not the right person, they will send it to somebody else. So we, we do take a team approach to all this process, but I did just want to make sure that they got to hear any other kind of words of wisdom that you might have for folks as they're thinking about this PhD program. So yeah, uh, students can always contact us and ask us questions about the program. And if we don't know the answers to it, we'll find out and, and get the answer back to you. Um, but we do, we can provide you with a degree plan or, or a little bit more information on deadlines or things like that in case you happen to uh, need more information. And, you know, some of you, I don't know, no one said this, but a, I, a lot of times folks are nervous about the GRE and GMAT. And I get that. Um, I had, I had an undergraduate degree from, um, University of Arkansas, where I've taken calculus and differential equations and somehow survived all that. Oh, that's how I got that below 3.0 GPA. But anyway, um, then I went back to graduate school. And so my master's was such that if you're over 40, you didn't have to take the GRE, which I don't understand the relationship between that, but nonetheless, it was great. So I went to go apply to UNT for my PhD program, you know, a smirky little ad to, well, I'm over 40, so I don't have to take it. And I go, uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> and so what I did is I went to, to some hotel in Dallas that had a GRE prep class, and that was so incredibly helpful. And so as you're, you know, putting together your application format, I just really encourage you to put your pe best foot forward. And those, um, I'm not, you know, I don't get any, any, anything on the side for promoting those programs. I don't have a particular one to say, but I'm saying somehow prepare yourself for that. Um, Cause it's a, it's a good process for yourself to think through, um, you know, where, where may have may where may you have some gaps and then what could you do to help fill those gaps so that when you come in in the fall that you can hit the road running. Um, we do have a, a primer course um, over the summer as, you're, as people are coming in. And so there is an opportunity to kind of dust some of those statistical cobwebs off. But sometimes it's helpful that you kind of come up with that own awareness on, your, on, your, on yourself so you can kind of get a sense for how you're going to navigate this process. So I really encourage you to, to do all that you can to present a really good, good step forward and and those GRE prep classes are great. I wish I'd actually done one on English because my math, my math part was pretty good because I'd gone to the prep class, didn't spend any time on the English part, and that was really, really hard. So anyway, and you can contact any of us anytime. We will totally tell you our experiences. We are all super um, just, you know, very transparent in our experiences. Here I am going to YouTube telling everybody I had less than a 3.0 GPA in my undergrad, so it doesn't get more transparent than that. So anyway, what else can we answer for you? Because I'm sure people are hungry for lunch. I have a question. Yeah, Brian. Uh, how is for out of state students how is uh, room and board handled is there you do you normally stay on campus is that extra is that factored into the cost um i'll take a stab at that although oh yeah i think ralph ryan maybe you could say this so when people come to campus they usually stay at um, one of the hotels around around town so they st we are very close to stay bridge and what's the other one ralph ryan that's right in front of campus 
Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I've never stayed there before. I, I, I stayed at a hotel right on broad, uh, Broadway, I believe. Oh, okay. But there's a lot of great places near the, the campus to, to stay at. That are and they're, well. Yeah, and they're less than $100 a night. I know when I interviewed here, or no, I, I came here to teach one, one summer. Greg Wong asked me to come and teach, and he told me about this hotel, get a, get a room at State Bridge, and they'd pay for it. It was less than $100 a night. And I thought, well, that kind of made me nervous because living in Dallas, I'm like, I've got to yeah. go someplace and spend more. But it's very, 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 very nice hotels that are less than $100 a night. There's and a, that's on the students to pay for. Uh, there's okay. a, a Fairfield Inn, Marriott, that's on Broadway about 10, 15 minutes away from the school that has an $80 UT Tyler rate that we use there as well. So a lot of different options. Thank you for that. And just real quick, if anyone is looking to relocate to the Tyler area and you're interested in getting an apartment or something like that, there are plenty of apartments close to campus that would be easy to access. But um, just like with the hotel, that room and board is separate from the tuition and fees we mentioned earlier. And then Brian, I think you asked a question about the particular dates. And so we, we don't have the dates for our class meetings for the new academic year. Um, we, we will probably publish those somewhere in the summer. Um, but generally it's like, the, we generally go the first weekend that we have, um, that the first weekend of the academic year of the semester. And then it's pr pretty much every three weeks, weekends after that. But then if Thanksgiving moves it out a week, the academy can move it out a week, spring break can move it out a week. So it's kind of like that. Um, if you email me, Brian, I can share you, I can share with you what our schedule is this year. And they tend to be the same, presuming that the academy doesn't move their conference or think, you know, Thanksgiving is a goofy time that moves around all over the place. So um, anyway, and what we are doing now um, in Kristen will appreciate this we are publishing the whole academic year at one time as opposed to one semester at a time we have kind of figured out that so thanks for that sure anything else in the chat before we should go get lunch i'm always hungry and we do have lunch on saturdays when we have when you come to when you come to classes on saturdays you have lunch we have a lunch and learn you don't have to learn if you don't want to during lunch but we do provide lunch so that you don't have to go off the campus because that's a quick turnaround well thanks everybody for being on here i really really appreciate this this is um, looking forward to seeing your applications if you have any 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 questions please contact any of us or all of us and we will we will hopefully give you all the same answer, but if not, we'll we'll figure out who the tiebreaker is. All right. I will you can so I guess stop recording and then